Now, there are things I want you to do. I would like you, number one, I would like you to do some reading down there for the ancient people that lived around San Francisco. And those people are called the Ohaloni people. And I think there are a few of them still extant, but they had the highest and greatest linguistic vocabulary of any language in the world. Those are the Ohaloni people. They lived on the fish. They lived on the shellfish of, around San Francisco. I would really very much like for you to get in contact with them and just spend a bit of time with them, those that remain, so that you kind of can have the ancient wisdom and their thinking. They have a different way of thinking. They have a lateral way of thinking. In university, you're going to be taught vertical thinking, but they think differently. They think outside the box. Now, all of you have got to start thinking outside the box to, to have answers for the future. Right now, before I came in here, um, uh, I wrote a letter to The Economist magazine. And there is a man who is a very good friend of mine in The Economist, and it's page 76 of The Economist. His name is Akira Mayawaki. Akira Mayawaki, he is a full professor in Japan. He is the one right now who is doing all of the planting across the world. And it's called the Mayawaki method. And they, the, the editor in, in The Economist made a very snarky remark about him. So I've just written to The Economist in New York and told them what to do with themselves. Because I think we need uh, people like Mayawaki. He is planting, actually starting to do huge plantations in the United States. And in the United States, he's using 22 species, putting them into mass plantings of high, low and ground level species, which you're going to be having to look at in the future. So just familiarize yourself. When I was a young child in Ireland, I'm doing this fairly fast for you. Just I want you just to relax and just listen to me. When I was a young child in Ireland, by the time I was 11, my whole family were killed in a car crash. My mother's family were the ancient people of the southern part of Ireland. They were the kings of Ireland. And if you know the word Killarney, I'm sure all of you have heard the word Killarney in the south of Ireland, have you? Mm -hmm. The lakes of Killarney? Well, the lakes of Killarney were the domain, my family's domain. And the castle of Ross, which you can look up on the internet, R-O-S-S, -S, was the domain of my mother's family. We were the kings of Monster, and we uh, built that castle of Ross in the fifth century. And the castle, and prior to that time, we were the educators of the great, um, the great kings of Europe. My family were. They were known for their, um, they were known for really their teaching abilities, actually, and all kinds of other things. Um, my father's family um, were. Can I use the word to you, bastards? You, do you know that word, bastards? <laughs> they, um, yes, I'm sure you do know that word. They were, <laughs> they were, they were landed, what's known as Anglo-Irish. Um, my father's family are Viscounts, and uh, my granduncle is Lord Charles Beresford, Admiral of the British Fleet. Uh, even though I speak uh, Gaelic. Um, they, um, I'm related, unfortunately, I'm related to Princess Di, and I'm also closely related to Churchill. So I had a very bad time. In Ireland and in England, women, just because we have ovaries, women are disinherited, and they're disinherited to this day. Um, a woman will not inherit um, a great estate. The inheritance, of uh, it's called primogenitor, Inheritance goes through the male line. So I was left with my name. So that's what I have. So I'm starting like you kids. I started like you kids from the very beginning. So what you have to do is, is um, when you're getting your, doing your studies, I'm asking you to please go into the physics, first year physics, ask the professors there, tell them you're interested in the forest and go and try and audit some of the, the classes for first year physics because you're going to need it. 
in the um, movement of sunlight into the trees, it's a quantum structure that takes place, it's quantum mechanics that happens. It sounds very posh, it sounds extraordinary, it sounds very difficult, it isn't, it's bloody simple. So just don't get excited about it. And if you don't understand some things, look, go after those blinking professors, hound them until you understand it. And you can tell them, I said it. And then if they don't believe me, go and phone E.O. Wilson and he will agree with me and he'll say, hound the buggers. Get and make sure you get value from your money from the universities. So you will be the first people to understand the physics of trees. It's very, very important. What I'm saying is really important. And if you get really bad, get in contact with me and I'll help you. I'll pull some strings for you. Now, let's start off with something very important. I'm going to speak now, just I am going to speak it as a story form. In the beginning of, we'll call it the creation of the universe, because creation for some people is an artificial thing. I, as a scientist, have no other word. Um, Stephen Hawkins, as he was dying, also used these words. We do not understand really how the universe was created, but it was. In the beginning, we have our own solar system. We have free energy by means of the sun. This is what your future, future career will depend on the sun because the trees farm the sun. Without sun, we would have no trees. So in the beginning of the solar system, in the beginning of our system of living, what happened was something very extraordinary on earth. Um, when they were doing the NASA space program, because I'm intimately uh, tied in with that also, um, they were looking for other planets that had trees, had life, maybe silicon forms of life, maybe carbon forms of life. They haven't come up with anything so far. So far, um, Jamie Cameron with his films, he's, they are films, they are imaginary films, they're wonderful films, but so far he hasn't photographed anybody real from Mars or anybody real from Pluto. This is it for us, folks. This is our family home. It's the planet. Now, it has taken millions and millions and millions of years. We think, starting from a thing called a stoma underwater or a chlor chlorella unicell, we think that life began with a unicell of some kind. A long time ago, they think it's chlorella. A lot of experiments have been done with that. But then came a thing which is what you would call division of labor. And it would be millions and millions and millions of years ago that the division of labor began with the chlorella. And you have a species called maybe Volpox. And that species was a bit larger, a bit more complex. All of these still reside in the ocean. All of them, all of them. The Pleurocalis, Capsonales, Nosticales, Camisiphonales, all of these orders live in the ocean. And if you turn your head towards the ocean right now, they are all there in the ocean right now and they're invisible, but they're very, very important for you to know that they're there, okay? So what happens when you have, when you have um, the forest growing and the forest luxuriating uh, for the planet is there is a concept called the Gaia of the planet Earth that they, just like you, um, one of my PhDs is in medicine, one of my PhDs is in heart surgery, and one of them is in the manufacture of artificial blood. You look at a tree and you look at the human body, and there's a great similarity between the two. The similarity that exists is in the chlorophyll, that you look out to the ocean or you look to the trees or you look all around you, the chlorophyll in a tree is almost identical to your, your, um, your red blood cell, is in, uh, almost identical to your hemoglobin within your red blood cell. It's extraordinary. The structure of the molecule is extraordinary. So sit back again now a little while and just think about this. The sun is important. The sun is very, very important. The sun 
lands on a tree, the sun lands on a leaf anywhere in the forest or a leaf anywhere in agricultural land. And what happens is that the sun produces a body of energy called a photon. And a photon can replace an electron one-to-one -one in a one-to-one -one ratio. It spills off the electron. And when you go into university, you're going to hear about things called valencies. There are all kinds of elements all over the world. There's magnesium, there's aluminium, there's hydrogen, there's oxygen, and they're all described chemically by their valencies. And the valency is the electron cluster around the nucleus. And the valency can spill off one of the electrons. And when that happens, there's a cascade of energy. And that cascade of energy, somehow, the trees learned how to capture that cascade of energy. And that's why I say the trees farm the sun. Now for you and for me, the same thing happens, but it happens in reverse. For us, we need to breathe. And for us, we need to breathe not carbon dioxide into our mouth, which would kill us. By the way, if we had too much carbon dioxide would kill us. The trees can take massive amounts of carbon dioxide. It doesn't kill them, it gives them life. But the carbon dioxide will kill us. We need to breathe oxygen. The Earth and the atmosphere of the Earth is a tight system. The trees produce the oxygen. We take in the oxygen, we breathe in the oxygen, and if we didn't breathe in the oxygen, we would die. So all of you 17 year olds and all of you 16 year olds, I'm going to ask you to stop breathing for the next half hour. If you don't believe me, just stop breathing and you will find yourself in a pretty bad situation very soon. So if somebody in the future says to you, ah, they come along and say, we don't need trees. Oh, we don't need trees and we don't need anything green. We need pavement. We need tarmacad and we need structures uh, made all out of concrete. You just say to them, hey, hold your breath for a half an hour and I'll prove to you that you do need oxygen. And oxygen is recycled all over the planet. And if you're studying your chemistry, it's called an oxidation reduction reaction. It means oxygen is popped in and popped out. That's all that means. In chemical terminology, that's all it means. No big deal, it's oxygen comes, oxygen goes. No big problem. Carbon dioxide comes, carbon dioxide goes. You live by means of oxidation reduction and the trees do too. So now you say to yourself, well, what in God's name am I doing studying trees? What in God's name am I doing wanting to be a forester? Aha. Now, the next time you go out into the forest, right? And I hope that's fairly soon because California is fantastic. I mean, you're just fantastic down there. Lean against a redwood. Put your elbow up against the redwood and look up the tree. Does anything strike you as being very peculiar about this? Like, does anything strike you as, can I see the top of the tree? You know, like, I'd like to see the top of the tree. Well, I, I tell you, the, the bunch of you, and I'd, I'd like for you all to be friends, please be friends with one another, go out and lie around a tree and look up at the top. There's a very basic question you can ask yourself. Why is the bloody thing so tall? I mean, why couldn't the tree be a tiny tree? Why couldn't the, the, the redwood be a teeny weeny little tree? There's a very important answer to that question. In California, the redwoods have huge, huge, up to 3,340 sometimes meters. They're huge, up to 340, I think, feet. They're huge. And actually some of the old people in California, the Ohaloni people will tell you that they went even higher than that. And the Ohaloni people will tell you that the circumference of the biggest ones were over 60 feet in full circumference. I, I mean, I've seen these. These are the stages are huge, 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 huge. But why are they so tall? 
because they're applicator species. They aim for the sky. They need to aim for the sky because they can become condenser units because the fog comes off the ocean in the morning in California and it gets condensed on the trees. And that condensing system is the fertilization for the egg and the sperm at the top of the tree to produce new trees. That's where your seeds come from, from the top of the trees. And it has to be at the top of the trees because those eggs and sperm have to have water and the water's got to reach that high. Now, when I was last down in California, I was talking to some of the ancient people there and they told me that that fog was at once upon a time, and it's not so long ago, it was a nine hour fog that some days that would come in and now you're down to a three hour fog. So guess what, your aquifers are emptying. Guess what, the place, I was supposed to plant trees down there in my honor. There's a garden down there in, oh, in Merrin County in honor of me, and not a garden, but a park actually. And I was supposed to plant a tree. I couldn't, I couldn't get the shovel into the ground. I simply couldn't do it because the ground was so hard. You got to get the blinking redwoods back into California. You got to get them planted into California. You just have to do it. And how you're going to do it, look, there are people like me in the world. Um, there are, and find the people like me, find the people like Akira Mayawaki. Find us, we will help you. They have got to get be put back into California. So that is why the tree is so tall. Then there's another thing. There's another little item about the trees. They have bark that's fire resistant. You have always had fire in California. And I do want to mention this to you. It's very, very important. And no, this is not beer, it's water. <laughs> do not plant eucalyptus species in California. You have loads of eucalyptus species in there. They have all, oh, you're drinking too, Katrin. They have, they have the ability for a flashpoint. And I think the flashpoint is 47 degrees centigrade. You have had 40 to 7 degrees centigrade. And the oil and the resins and the oleoresins in the, the eucalyptus in the bark of the eucalyptus. What happens, it sheds its spark, it doesn't shed its leaves. All you need is one cigarette and you have a flash fire. That's all you need, or one spark. You have a flash fire and it's very easy in California to have a spark. Get rid of the eucalyptus out of California. Now you can do that to the redwoods, you can do it to your Thuya plicatus, you can do it to the firs, you can do it to all the species you have, the torres down there, You all the species you have there, they won't burn. It's very difficult to make them burn because they have such padding on the trunk that those trees won't burn. They've seen fire before, but they don't know how to deal with eucalyptus. Eucalyptus should be planted in Australia. It's an Australian species for God's sake, keep it there because I don't want to hear any more people losing their lives in California. I don't want to because of stupidity. And I can use the word quite fluently here because nobody will get after me. You can't fire me. That's a stupid thing that somebody did. And I tried to get hold of Jerry Brown when I was last down there. And I didn't, uh, uh, Steve Costa tried to get me to talk to, uh, you know, I tried to talk to Jerry Brown to say, for God's sake, get rid of this eucalyptus or tell people to be careful around them because they're not careful and they have barbecues and da, 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 da. You will have flash fires from them. So anyway. Now, I wanted to talk to you. I've got a few notes here. Um, the concept of trees on the planet is very, very important. Now you may work in, in, in the United States, but I have a feeling that if you go into forestry, you will be working all over the world because we're going to have to replant the forest. And you're saying to me, why Diana are you saying this to me? Really, I need to talk to you for about 10 hours on this, but I think I'd bore you to death. The Gaia, as I mentioned just, just before, Gaia is the unit of a living system. 
that Gaia is our home, it's the planet Earth, and it has to have a green mantle. And why it has to have a green mantle is because it can reflect the infrared ra radiation back into the sky. And it does that on a daily basis. And what we have managed to do is too many people are driving cars. We have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the carbon dioxide from burning trees, from all kinds of things, accumulates in the atmosphere and stays there for a long, long time, maybe up to 100 years, maybe even more. We're not quite sure about this. It makes a black shell around planet Earth. And so when the trees are there next to you, when they're photosynthesizing and they're drinking in carbon dioxide and producing oxygen, and what happens is that you, you have, um, let's put it this way, you have a system whereby the release, the sunshine is coming in to planet Earth, and then it hits the trees and it's reduced in its energy. So it becomes infrared that goes back up, but it doesn't go back up into space now, it hits the ceiling of carbon dioxide and then it bounces and comes back down to the earth and like a tennis ball back up again and then down again and then back up again, just like you're playing tennis. But what that does is it heats the oceans, it heats the land and it heats the, the air mass. So the idea that you're going to have to have in the future is to plant as many trees as possible because too much forest has been taken down all over the world. It's not just in the United States. It's not just in Canada. It's not just in Japan. It's not just in Europe. It's everywhere. Too much forest has come down. And the forest, when you're planting in the trees, will drink in the carbon dioxide that's shelved up in the atmosphere. That's all you're doing. You're planting the trees so that carbon dioxide comes out so we can go back to our normal mythology of living so there's less shell around planet Earth. That's all. That's what you're doing is re you're reducing the effect of climate change. And it is the only way in my opinion as a scientist to date to do that because the, the the planet has taken 600 million years to learn how to make a tree to learn that the tree should farm the sun and that the tree should absorb the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere because before there were trees there was a toxic atmosphere of carbon dioxide there was too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the trees have learned, their DNA has learned like you have, to pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And really, that's, that's what you're doing. That is what you're doing. So you're taking a shovel and a spade. You're figuring out the trees you should be planting. And by the way, here in California, the other trees you should be planting is a tree that's gone on the endangerment list now, which is a uh, Quercus Douglasi, which is your blue oak. It's a disgrace that your, your blue oak, you have hardly any blue oaks left. I mean, that's disgraceful. And you have all of the other oaks. The richest cachet of oaks in the world is to be found in the United States of America. And now they have become the most endangered species because everybody's been being careless. Everybody's taken them down. And let me look at an oak for a minute. An oak is strong. An oak is a feeding tree. Do you know in your back door right now, you look outside, outside your house right now, or where some of you go bicycling, some of you go walking, some of you go driving. Do you know that in the past around you, there was a balin, balin holistic culture. That means a culture of growing and eating acorns. That's what the people lived on in the past around you, as well as the pines up in the mountains and the pines, the pine seeds up in the mountains are used now 
they're used by they're sold by auction but around you every one of you is living around an area where the oaks were once upon a time and there are some archaeological features all around the rocks around you where they used they 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 crush crush the oaks so much just the oaks and the oaks are really that the, the meat in the oak is quite large crushed them down and so they made holes over the centuries in rocks and what they did is they made bannocks out of them and the bannock has a high uh, protein uh, protein and carbohydrate a lot of carbohydrate and it's carbohydrate that is all glued together in a polymeric form and if you're eating those bannocks you won't get diabetes what you do is your it functions in your body as an insulin regulator and those people never had diabetes so anyway they're all the oaks you've got to protect the oaks so it's very simple to plant an oak you take it out of its shell put it into the ground roll it in and plant it uh, it's very very easy to do you can in your lifetime you can repair many many forests And now I want to talk to you about something else, and this is going to be quickly. Why I'm asking you to study a bit of biochemistry, chem medical biochemistry, is we just found a very, a very, very weird phenomenon in, in trees, your trees in particular, and all around the world. A very weird thing. Have you heard of breast cancer? I'm sure you have heard of breast cancer. I'm sure you have heard of prostate cancer. Well, inside in a tree, there are endogenous fungi that live in the tubes, the xylem, live outside. I mean, the xylem tubes and the phloem in the tree. And in the redwoods, it's spectacular because it's so long. There's, those tubes are so long, taking water from the ground to the sky. Inside there, there are fungi of the ascomycetes, and that's a highly evolved fungi, and the basidiomycetes, very, very highly evolved. And they have a war between the tree, the inside of the tree and the fungus itself. And so that the fungus would survive, they produce compounds called taxanes, taxane compounds. And for, in other trees, they produce taxodiols, Taxanes are very complex biochemicals. There's your anti-cancer. For you gentlemen, taxodiols are anti-prostate. And I would say four of you, of all four, will have prostate cancer in your lifetime. So listen up to this, because most men, nine out of 10 men get prostate cancer. And for that very one reason alone for you gentlemen, those trees should be protected. And for the ladies, the taxanes, one very one reason alone, because breast cancer is high on the agenda for women. Now I want to tell you something very quickly about all the pines you have, all of the Monterey pines you have, you bring them back because the pines produce aerosols there are all kinds of aerosols produced by all of the trees in California. And the aerosols lift up from the mouth, the stoma, the opening in the leaves up into the air when the, when the temperature is warm. They ride into the air. And the alpha and the beta pinings, when you are in the forests, protect your body, protect your blood system, your T cell ratio, it protects your T cell ratio from all cancers for one month. So when you have clients and you're planting trees for clients, this is the other reason you're doing it. We're trying to get rid of cancer off the planet Earth. And all of the tests, clinical studies for that, what I'm talking about right now, has been done in Japan. And the other studies of the physics of the function of the aerosols have been done in American universities in conjunction with MIT, in conjunction with German universities and Swedish and Finnish universities. It has taken about 19 different groups of physicists to put that 
those factors together. And the research is very mathematical, but that's why I'm asking you to do a little studying of physics. You don't have to be another Stephen Hawkins. Like, don't go into the classes thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be, they expect me to be Stephen Hawkins. Because I know it's an American culture. You're expected to be great at everything. You go in just to learn what you need to learn. You go, you, you're not going in to get a Nobel Prize. You're going in to learn what you need to learn to be absolutely fantastic at your work. That's what you need. Now, I want you to, to there's, I want you, if you can, if you have seen The Call of the Forest, have you seen my film, Call of the Forest? Well, when I'm talking about Akira Mayawaki, when I had, when they've when they dissed him down in The Economist, that's the man that I'm so pissed off by that they've said anything bad about him because he's a genius. So anyway, try and keep the call of the forest for you, for yourself, um, for research, for thinking about the forest and the trees that you have around you right now. They bleed in out of the roots. They bleed in fulvic acid and humic acid into the water systems, fresh water systems that go out into the Pacific. And that's how come your whales are alive. That's how come the whales travel and you have so much fish in the Pacific. You take down the trees, you kill the whales because both of them are connected. And this is called the web of life. And you will find as you get older, the web of life is extraordinary. And the Ohaloni people, if you do find them, and I hope you will, the Ohaloni people will talk to you about some of this aspect of the web, web of life. Now, I want to say something to you is that a year and a half ago in Canada, I was down in a place called Windsor and I was doing a big talk down there. I had a huge audience, an, an enormous audience. And some of the, um, the unions are planting trees in Canada and actually they're planting them all over the world. You probably hear, don't hear about it in your news broadcast, but it is actually happening. You're not unusual. It's happening in Japan, it's happening in China, it's happening all over the world, in Taiwan, everywhere. So what happened was I got a, this strange message through on the stage from somebody and there was somebody at, standing at the backstage and was a very, very, very old woman. And she was tall and she was kind of very ragged looking. And the message was uh, she, she needed to speak to me. So I said, look, I, I, I'm speaking. I, I, I'm going on stage. I, I can't speak to you now. Can you wait for me? So she did, she, was, she waited for me at the back of the stage. We got a chair for her, she waited for me. And it turned out that she was a medicine woman from the Ashinaabe people. And the Ashinaabe bridge both Canada and the United States. And what she said is you need to hear the legends for the future. And the legends for the future are the following, that at the time of now, the time of now, we're on what's known as the seventh fire. This is their saying. It's very, very, very old legend. And that she said to me, this was before COVID. She said to me, there will be a change in the world immediately. It's happening and you need to know it, Diana. We're going to have some drastic changes happening. And she said, you cannot even imagine what they're going to be like. And of course, afterwards, I realized she was talking about COVID. Um, and she said, we are now at a crossroads in the world. If you go towards the technological aspects of the world and ignore nature, we're doomed. But if you go and protect nature, if that will lead us to the eighth fire. And the eighth fire is a time of great happiness. And I said to her, will we have an eighth fire? Will we be able to make the decision to protect nature and go towards the eighth fire. And she said, yes. And I've never forgotten that. You have to bend your head in honor for the people who have so much wisdom. So I'm passing that on to you. And I want you to know that no matter how hard your life is going to be, maybe or maybe not, you've made a good decision in what you're doing. You've made an excellent decision. And that's why I'm here today. It's because of you. So always remember, I've told you that, no matter how tough things get in the future, and I will probably be dead then, but in the future, 
there will be a change towards the natural world. We will protect the natural world. We will succeed in doing it. And when you get married and you have your children, it will be there for you. You are the beginnings of something really phenomenal that we've never seen before in the world, where young people are teaching their parents how to think about the future. So go for it. Now, I'm open to questions from any of you. You can slaughter me now. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Well, thank you, Diana, and, and I love the way you weaved uh, medical knowledge, science, and sacred knowledge together and, and ended with kind of an optimistic uh, message, too. But it doesn't mean we don't have to act like crazy and make, make changes also. Oh, we do. Um, oh, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but thank you. And um, yeah, I know uh, that folks have questions um, for you, and um, who would like to ask Diana a question? And maybe Izzy, you can help um, translate if we can't hear them through the computer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Beth, just raise your hand. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I was wondering, uh, does infrastructure near trees like limit the benefits of uh, the aerosols that are released? No. No. Okay, uh, let's go to um, Ben. Uh, oh. to, give you, to give you an answer to some, I'll give you an example. Um, have you peeled an orange, an orange with your hand? Yeah. Um, uh, the aerosol in an orange is explosive. It's like a landmine, actually, if you look at it with a microscope or look at it with a lens, it's, uh, they're like a landmine. And you put your nail in or your thumb into the orange and you tear it a little bit. And the smell is everywhere. It's explosive. Some of the trees have that ability too. Not all of them, but some of them. So the answer is no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ben? Uh, other than biochemistry and physics, where are some other classes you'd recommend to take in university? You're going to have to, you're going to have to translate that. It sounds very muffled uh -huh. to me. Yeah, um, Ben was asking, other than biochemistry and physics, what are some other classes that you would recommend for folks that are going to university? I, I, I would say that you really, really need organic chemistry. Um, again, again, I would say to you, um, to, to ask to go in and listen to the classes of organic chemistry and maybe attend some of the labs. You know, I did one of my PhDs in the States, in, you know, in, in stores, um, and I, I was allowed to do that. The other thing that I did, which I hope we won't have to use, I also studied nuclear chemistry um, because we have so many reactive nuclear reactors all over the world. And now we're finding there's a huge amount of cesium isotope in the atmosphere. And the cesium isotopes are hitchhiking on the 2.5 particulate pollution in the air. So um, it's no harm to just do a bit of reading around that. But other than that, uh, what I have done myself, if you want to do this, is, and I'm astonished by how important it is. I've done an, also a bunch of television, television series, and I didn't really realize, and in my, my writing from my books, I didn't realize how important art was. When I was your age, I had done, already done a lot of art, but I thought it was fiddle farty stuff. I thought that, you know, this is art just for art, but actually it's very important. Um, I'm going to be doing, my life is going to be put into a huge film in uh, next year or the year after. And like I can put all the pictures together. I can do some of the editing. I can do, I just never knew that was important. So if any of you are artistically inclined, any of you, even if it's woodworking, if it's, you know, leather working or any art at all, keep doing that. Even though you're going through university, keep doing that. And writing, the ability to write a write a true sentence is very important. Writing, you, all of you, one of you, maybe 
might become a famous author. Or maybe all of you might become famous authors. You've bloody well got to learn to write. And the computer destroys that. So get a pencil, get a piece of paper, and, you know, once a week, write something, even if you keep diaries. Uh, writing is kind of like a hidden art now, and it's difficult to do. So do that. And then the other thing is, you folks, too, are going to have to stand up and talk for yourself. Like you might have to give big speeches. So do a little bit of acting. Any, any of those things that enhance your character, enhance your ability to stand up and just to say, screw you. Like you have to learn how to do that, to stand up and say, this is how I think. And this is the way it's going to go. You have to have strength in yourself. And believe you me, when you believe in yourself, because art helps it and music helps, all those things help to tighten your brain and to tighten your feeling of possession of yourself. And they make you better fathers and better mothers. If you've got a better home life, then you're home free. Yeah, I, I know it's a big thing I'm talking about, but honestly, it's, it's encompassing your whole life, the happiness of your life. And if you do fail some subjects, get over it. Like, get over it. If you're, you're going into the scientific world, it's always the following the questions of yes and no. And very often, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. So get over it. And just go out and have a drink or whatever. Just get over that. And don't take yourself so seriously. So the next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, if plants and trees provide so many benefits, and why were medicinal practices derived from trees and forests abandoned for conventional medicine? Did you catch oh, that? Oh, yes. I pretty well got that one. Um, the International Handbook of Forest Therapy. Um, I've just uh, contributed a full chapter to that as a representative. I, I'm supposed to be the representative of North America on that. Um, it's the, you should get your hands on that book. It's just come out from Cambridge University Press, it's Cambridge Scholars Press. I know you can get it at Berkeley. I know it's there's a copy there in the library there. So it's the International Handbook of Forest Therapy. Um, the, the World Health Organization backed that book and the World Health Organization has now decided that the practices of forest bathing and the practices of the medicines coming from the trees is going into uh, all the French speaking countries. And I, I expect it to go into the United States and other places in the next year or two. So you you keep your eyeball on that. That'll be important for you. Great. Okay. Yeah, Ariana. What else? Oh, I have two more questions. Uh, if housing, do you think we have to get rid of like, the capitalist system uh, in the world if you do believe that? Having capitalism is bad for the environment, and what do you think is the best economic or like government system? Um, well, you know, you see, you can you can say you can say to yourself um, that capitalism is not good, all right, and I don't think capitalism is especially good, but you see, you look at me. I defy the capitalist system because I do a lot of things pro bono and people can't understand that. I've done major, major things pro bono. So what you can do is you can look after your money as best you can, but then when it comes to the crunch and you think you have to do something that's very important, uh, money is not a, money doesn't hold the value that maybe you were told in your mind for capitalism. And that destroys the idea of the hedge fund thinking, because if you're super brilliant and you can come in and you can solve a problem and you're doing it for nothing, uh, it's uh, it, it really freaks people out. I, I believe you me, it freaks them out. So that's one way of jumping the system. But I think what's happened is not so much capitalism is uh, monopolies and we've allowed that to happen. We've allowed Amazon to happen, to have great power. We've allowed all of the, you know, Bezos and all that gang. They've, they have too much money. They have too much power. And Elon Musk, I mean, I, I know Elon Musk. It's too much power. It's too much money and too much power. 
Um, and there will be, I think there will be in the future more monies for, for you because there has to be. Because if the world keeps functioning the way it's functioning, it can't be guided by Wall Street. It simply can't. It has to be guided by spiritual values and values that are good for everybody. Because if you go down the tank, there's nobody there to work. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by having healthy families, doing your music so that you're, you're, you, know, you can spill your mind out onto many, many things. And then you'll become a very strong person. You'll be able to stand up and be counted. You know, yeah, you, 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 you girly. <laughs> Um, what's the most important thing you learned from your ancestral and spiritual background? What I've learned from them as an orphan child, I was supposed to be put into uh, like what do you know what a residential school is? Where all the babies were all found just recently in Canada and around the world. I was supposed to go into one of these residential schools and it's like a boot camp. Um, but because my father's family were all hoi polloi, they were all, uh, you know, friends of the king and queen. Um, the judge was afraid to put me into one of those schools. He was terrified that he'd lose his job. And as a matter of fact, they're so, such awful people. They would fire him anyway. So I went down to a valley called Les Sheens and I was raised in the Brehan Laws. And in the Brehan Laws are the ancient Celtic laws, the Irish laws of around the birth of Christ. And those laws told you that you love, try to love people and you try to do the best you can. And basically it's the premise of, of, of Christianity, but it was there before Christianity. Love other people as you love yourself. You don't have to fall in love and jump into bed with them. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about regard them, take the stand back, look at people, give them the benefit of the doubt. That is what I've learned. And it's a very hard lesson to, to keep your finger on all of your life. And I've tried to do that. I haven't always succeeded, but trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. And when I was teaching in university, the kids who were very poor, who, who had a tough time eating, I gave them special classes. I would take them aside and I would give them special, special tutoring. And I've always done that. And I've always, um, if, for instance, in, in, in my own personal life, I have uh, joined Médecins Sans Frontières and Médecins Sans Frontières is Doctors Without Borders. I have uh, had huge auctions for them and piled in piles of money. I kept all the safe houses in Tusla going in when there was the war on in Montenegro and all of the women in Montenegro were protected and they were in other places, they were slaughtered and their babies were thrown into wells and they were thrown into the wells and husbands were shot in those places. Um, so you can do something and do what you can do. Uh, I would advise you to do that. Do what you can do to make things better. And if all of us do it, then we, we succeed. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, I had a question about uh, planting native trees. Is it best to like go out into the forest and collect seeds or try and find uh, like seeds at nurseries or something like that? Oh, okay, okay. Um, the United States has got a handbook, have the extension, uh, agricultural ex extension handbooks, and they would be at the university and they would be in your library, maybe, I'm not sure, but you can get them, you can get them fairly cheaply. And you get hold of those handbooks if you're interested in it. And it's a really big book. I mean, I have them at home. I use the American books at home. So what you're asking me is something that's very important. A tree will grow in its own terroir in the sense of ecology. It's matched to, it's perfectly matched to its own ecology. But what you want to do when you're going collecting seeds is go and go, I call them ex -coticians. I mean, it's like Winnie the Pooh. You go out and you find the best tree, the healthiest tree, 
And then you have to read to find out when you collect those seeds. Like me as a botanist, I know how to do that. Like for instance, I can tell you for the oaks right now. The oaks will be ripening right now for you down in California. And what you do is you find the best blue oak, that's Quercus Douglasi in your area, and you go for a walk and you inspect it. And when you find the first seeds of the oak falling down, and the first ones will be aborting, will be aborted from the oak because they'll have insects in them. So you collect the seeds from a good quality oak, put them in a bucket of water, and the floaters, what you do is you discard them and the ones that sink, you, 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 um, you plant them. And you take them out of the acorn, acorn cup and you examine them and they're your quality seeds. It takes you a minute to plant two inches down the ground about two inches and just let them go plant and plant and plant and plant. But it's the, it is the, um, it is the, some seeds like you have, some of the species you have are triggered by fire in California. Some of them are triggered by rain. Some of them like your magnolias are triggered by thunderstorms, by the uh, nitrogen in the air of thunderstorms. You just have to have like a, a special dictionary like I have, like that handbook of, of UDSA um, and just check it out. Um, so so you, you collect your seeds as you may, you go into the best places. And I would suggest to you when you're collecting, um, it become, that's actually a discipline all on its own to know about seeds and quality of seeds. It's a really big thing. And it's something that you need to know too. You know, it's, you're going into an industry, let's call it an industry, you're going into nature and you need to know an awful lot, but don't panic. If the information comes to your, into your head, like for me, if you drive a, a Porsche, or if you drive an E-type Jag, I'll never remember what kind of car you're driving. Never, never, never. But if I go to your house, I will remember every bloody tree in your yard. If I go to a place, I remember every tree everywhere. But I couldn't give you an idea how you got there because I'm not interested in cars or particularly I'm interested in green things. So what happens to you is your mind triggers and you think, oh, yeah, that's, a, you know, that's a tarry oak or this is a you know, this is a, you know, some one of the other, you know, uh, of the of the evergreens or some of the Monterey, Monterey cypresses, which grow so well in Ireland, you know, you, you will see them, but you have to give yourself time to learn that. But the terroir is very important. And when I, I did the Millennium Project, if you've read any of my books, I gave out three quarters of a million trees across all of North America. And they're from the best sources of trees, genetic sources of trees, try to keep an inventory of the ge genome of your tree. And also the other thing, keep watching for what the companion trees are, because we do not know, we have never taken down the pattern language of a real ancient virgin forest. That has never been taken down ever anywhere in the world. So these are things you're going to have to learn yourself. And I've learned a lot. You'll find stuff in try and read uh, in the Arboretum America book and try and read in the um, the the Boreal Forest, the Boreal Arboretum Borealis book. You'll get a lot of my thinking in there and just use it. Use it. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk about somatic cloning because you said it might be the future. Yeah, it is the future. Okay. What you do, um, that's that's a whole industry on its own. Um, the, the business that used to be there, there's only four businesses in the world that do somatic cloning. One of them is, was Cellfor, and I'm not sure if Cellfor is still there. You spell it C-E-L-F-O-R. And what you do, look at your arm. Tip, pull up your sleeve there and look at your arm. Could you do that? Yeah, look at your arm, all right? Look at the skin on your arm, all right? If I take a biopsy of the skin off your arm, okay? I can get that skin in the right kind of medium to grow a sheet of skin tissue. It's not your sexual tissue. It is your, it, this is called your, your diploid tissue. It's the tissue 
that is ordinarily in your body. Sexually, you have haploid tissue in all your sexual organs, you have haploid tissue. And what somatic cloning is the same thing as taking a piece off a tree, uh, just like a piece off your skin, and that is somatic cloning. It gives you the identity of the tree and you can grow a tree from that. The first, the first somatic cloning I was involved with was in stores. And that was done from a datura, from a carrot. And now we can do it with the human body. Now we can do it with trees. And it's, it is the cloning of really the library of that species. That piece of, of skin or that piece of tree will grow into the tree, will not grow into any other species, grow into an identical tree that you found. And that's the importance of keeping the ancient forest alive. All of the old, old forest, that's the important, because we can keep the genome of that tree that's been living for 4,000 years or maybe 5,000, in some cases, maybe 10,000 years. And it's withstood floods, it's withstood you know, all kinds of things, that's what you need to have in your forest. And we'll be doing that. You might be working in there in the future. Diana, I have a quick question. I'm Izzy, I'm off camera right now. Um, and so then we have to go, then I, and I, then because I have to go, I've got another appointment. Oh, oh no worries. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I would I was just going to quickly ask um, if you could use that to save a tree dying of disease. If you could. Somatic cloning? Yeah, somatic cloning. Somatic. Um, yeah. It depends on if it's systemic. If it's systemic, that means it's in the full system of the tree. No, it's no good. But if it's part of the tree that's healthy and part of the tree is diseased and you know it's not systemic, then you're okay. You can, you can save the tree, yeah. Right. Well, I think that's it. That's it, babes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Diana. It was a pleasure having you uh, join us today. And thank you for being so patient and asking all our, our questions. And um, oh, you're yeah, welcome. So appreciative of your wonderful work.